Christina Lakes uh, Watershed Management Plan is a community-based watershed plan. The plan was implemented in 2003. The initial plan was completed in 2005. And the implementation strategy for the plan, though it wasn't completed, we started working on um, strategies based on data gaps. And that started in 2004. The issues that arose from the management of the planning process came from uh, community surveys and the watershed committees, and it was more than one committee uh, stakeholders meetings that were held um, quarterly for two years. And a lot of people went through that process <coughs> that's in this room. Okay. Now, the broad-based issues were water quality, non-native plant species, fishery sustainability, forestry practices, wildlife values, shoreline and stream back uh, modifications. Each one of these categories has several subcategories underneath them, and um, that helped us quantify the level of concern and start setting um, action items um, in the plan. So we set short and long-term action items, and that was based on feasibility, um, level of concern, uh, impacts, so we divided, because there was the, the strategy is a whole binder and several topics under it. We decided to make it manageable to set it into categories for management, and those categories were core operation initiatives, public education and community involvement initiatives, and continuing to expand upon current monitoring programs, which includes all fisheries and wildlife. Okay. So the number one uh, thing that came out of the management planning process was the need to actually have a center to house all this information and to be continually available to the public and have a resource library. So the stewardship center was what was said to need to exist to even be able to continue with the watershed planning process and continue doing the recommendations from year to year. Oh, but this is that one. Yeah, I can't, I can't. Um, I'm going to go through this quick. It's just too many words on that, but... Uh, Core funding for 2012, we received a portion um, of our funding for 2012. At, as most people know, there's been a lot of environmental uh, cutbacks through all levels of government. So it makes it un uncertain for us for our expenses for the following year. We did receive some gaming, which we were told that we probably wouldn't, under our educational program, but it was far below what we generally receive. So it, we used to receive 50%, and we're just talking core funding. We're not talking about everything else, project-specific funding. So it went from 50%, and we received 20%. Our EKB Area C helps with a portion of our core expenses. The core expenses is rent, supplies, a portion of our education, resource library, part of my time, and if we get lucky, we get other funding to get an assistant in the summertime. Um, so that means you know approximately 45%. So we're on a shortfall of 55%. So we are putting all of our efforts into seeking and hopefully obtaining additional core funding so that we can continue. Um, the CLSS maintains well-established partnerships at all levels of government, including First Nations. And I'm so happy to see you here, Heidi. It's been a while. And uh, businesses, other NGOs, and individuals. Um, our dedicated directors, members, volunteers, staff, and professionals provide us with a lot of our services. And I must mention here that we average about 85,000 to 100,000 of in-kind services a year in the watershed. Um, the annual review um, and recommended action items help us to prioritize from year to year what we should be doing. And um, the proceedings of this meeting and addendums are attached to the watershed management plan and a progress report, which I have right there, and it will get passed around. Um, and so you, you can also obtain it on our website or on the ministry website, EcoCat. You can just Google it. And I don't know if the RDKB has that on there. You've got the watershed plan, right? So, I, yeah. Okay. So this center provides public access. We assist in liaison for environmental queries. We house reports, maps, data, best management practices, a resource library, and public education. 
and we um, also have a lot of local knowledge and expertise, and we have professional field staff and community participation. So we're getting into public education and community involvement. Ron Little has been awesome year to year doing the uh, late cleanup day, picking up all the garbage at the end of the day. And um, we thank him. He's not here today, but he's a great guy. Uh, Bart Stewart has a, a display set up over there. And they're also possibly hoping for a clean, drain, dry program in the boundary, uh, which focuses attention on preventing the spread of aquatic invasive plants slash animals via boats and equipment. So you can talk more about BARP during our break. Okay. Aquatic invasive species, Lisa Tedesco, ecosystem biologist, will be discussing species of concern in the province and region. And I put up pictures, Lisa, because I really didn't know what you were going to talk about. So I got purple loose stripe, I got zebra mussels, and I've got yellow perch, which, by the way, has already invaded our lake. Uh, Bearware program this year. Uh, that's Susan and Connie Herman from Ministry of Forest and Doug Shannon. That's all tables of the, the brochures and stamping them and getting everything ready to do the door-to-door -door presentations to people. Uh, that's Arnold DeBoon, uh, Conservation Officer from where again, Dave? Creston. Creston. And he helped with the Picking Fruit Program. And that's just our bear bands and me. And so we, um, residential, we uh, 672 homes. We did 29 businesses. We handed out to individuals such as resorts requesting brochures and whoever came in the door and out on our displays. So we distributed a total of 1,051 to individuals. Uh, the total media releases are eight. Um, that includes TV. Um, total hours for volunteers in 762. The total cash and kind value for the project for the summer was all surrounded to $16,000. And these are actually bears from here. And uh, Dave Webster, our conservation officer, will be discussing issues within our watershed about that. Okay. Uh, we offer free waterfront homeowner septic inspection kits, so we do have them available over on the table. Those are the blue tabs that you put in either your sink or your toilet. And if you're on the lake and if it runs out blue, you've got problems, but we don't monitor that. That's your baby. Okay. Uh, youth programs and events. Uh, we do a lot of youth programs, and these young stewards have been doing this since they were this big. And I can't believe how much they've grown. But So we custom design our uh, educational programs for the school curriculum. We do do bear awareness with kids. We do field exploration in the park. And we also put out book, uh, coloring books on fish life cycles, how animals prepare for winter, and what stewardship means to me. Okay. Uh, getting the information out there, I think most of you have seen some of our kiosks, but we have the two display boards, Bearware and our regular one. We have the parks kiosk that's going to be uh, redone this spring. Okay. Uh, most of you may have noticed the one over by the marina now. Okay. Uh, this is the one at North End. I'm sure a lot of people that are out in the boat have seen that one. And, okay. And we do educational bulletins. This is just a couple of them. We also do all those different brochures over there. This is still a hope of mine, and I may have a target funding agency. DC Hydro is very interested in us doing a educational bulletin on aquatic plants, and we do have 53 uh, identified plant, aquatic plants in Christina Lake. Uh, we still have our environmental endowment fund. It hasn't been leaping for the balance of money, but it's still there, and you get a charitable receipt if you donate to it. Uh, we do have the DVD, which is a tour around the lake with heart music from Nancy Potter. It's really cool. And uh, we do have that available in the office, and we do sell that. Okay, now we're getting into our monitoring programs. Once, right off, I have to thank Dave Beach, who's not here, and Glenn Brewer, who is here. Uh, these guys put up five months this year on the second disc for uh, water clarity and temperature uh, analysis. And Mike Sokol from Ministry of Environment will be presenting this year's sampling results. We do uh, monitor the lake with, for uh, zebra and quag and mussels. And we do have examples of them over here. And we get assistance from the University of Portland to do that. And that far one over there with the little arrow is the quaga. The other one's the zebra. And that's a boy that was pulled out of the water, the anchoring underneath it. And that's what can, when they start infesting your lake, what can happen. They also even can get into your water pipes and things like that. 
Um, Alan Stanley will be talking about Eurasian water milfoil and the 2011 program activities, challenges, and future plans. And these are just different methodologies. The, the, the diving that happens here, the harvester that happens, that's Okanagan Lake, and this is uh, the milfoil uh, weevil that is being used down in the States, and also in Ontario and Quebec, and there's more information about that. Enumerations. Um, most people know we have stream spawners and shore spawners. Uh, stream spawning is August to the end of September. Shore spawning is December through January. And the reds were mapped. We haven't done that for quite a few years, but that's just to ensure if people are interested to look at the map. If you own a uh, late front property, check first before you, well, you need a permit too, but check first before you do any work around your uh, in the water because you may be destroying uh, coconut fish spawning habitat. And DNA from samples that we took for quite a, for over the last little eight years, they can be frozen and then get the DNA out of them. Came from the streams, we collected 100 samples. We collected 100 samples from the shore spawning site off of East Lake Drive. And it, UBC Okanagan, Karen Fraser did a thesis on that. And the stream spawners originate from Kootenai Lake from historical stocking that the government did from 1901 to 1963. And the shore spawners are unique and genetically appear to be the sole native stock left in our lake. Um, rainbow trout, smallmouth bass, and kokanee were introduced into our system by the government in the, you know, in the 1900s. So. Uh, Sandra Creek had, uh, this year was 2,265 fish. Southern Creek was 17 fish. And McCray Creek was five fish. Okay. This chart or graph shows over the years that we've been sampling the counts. And Kokanee, they give it a broad range, three to five years life cycle. So as you can see from 2007 to 2011, the numbers are close. And 2005 to 2010, the numbers are fairly close. But McCray Creek and Sutherland Creek are in filling and they're, and they're failing. But because they're not genetic stock, they're considered uh, from here, native stock, that it's considered a contaminated stock now, so they won't be looking at doing any restoration on those systems. Okay. Uh, North Bay Boy Project actually ties into the kiosk that's at Sandra Creek that I showed you earlier, and this is a wetland protection initiative, not just for species at risk, it's also for because of the milfoil infestation there from boats going into this area. So it's worked out. Most people understand why it's there. You can still go in there. We're just hoping that you uh, shut off your motor, lift, lift up your prop, and if you, you're supposed to be carrying paddle, you know, so some people have gone in there, but we did catch a wakeboard boat in there, and they actually, and these guys know it, <laughs> tried to move it, so it kind of destroyed the, the little chain effect of keeping people out of there. Uh, Mark Hansen will be talking about the Riparian Area Protection Initiative and where we're at uh, for Area C. Um, we're still doing the Crystal Lake Foreshore inventory and mapping, and I will be trying to get some more funds. The baseline data is there. This took months and months and months, but it's all there now, every single lot, every single foot of crown land. So it just takes going out in a boat with a trimble unit and camera and noting any changes and re redoing it on the data and recalculating it, like retaining walls, uh, removal of substrate, removal, removal of native species, etc. Okay. Um, if you ever want to know what it takes to take one dock out of the lake, we had quite a few docks. We don't have as many. I think they've all floated away somewhere and they've gone to oblivion. But at one point we had like 76 docks out in the lake. Um, Peter went out again uh, this year and he mapped the docks all around the lake and they got a project to remove one. And um, they took it all apart, they brought it to Star Trek Beach. It's un, um, it was not, it was rough wood, it wasn't uh, treated wood, so they cut it all up and left it in a pile for firewood for campers, removed all the styrofoam and all the metal and just uh, disposed of it at the dump. At the dump. And um, it was a lot of work. I don't know how long it took them to do it, but a lot. And so you can see how much garbage comes out of one abandoned dock. So it's a lot that's left in the lake. Okay. Anyway, if you have any questions or concerns, you can always contact me. I have a cell phone. I have a phone here. I leave my home phone number on the phone here. And I really want to thank all of the volunteers and supporters and funders. Um, we're now into year 13, so it's been a long haul and it's been great. Okay. And this is the awe moment. 
Any questions? <laughs> oh, questions for Jeremy? Oh. Well, Bruce, I don't know whether you're going to mention it later, but the dock removal business, like we are using it as a fundraiser for the society. So if people have old docks they want to get rid of, old wooden docks, let the society know, or Brenda, and we'll try and make an arrangement for a donation to get rid of the quarry. Okay, yes, and there is a, there's a project coming down the road, I think, next year that's going to address that. Right, Brenda? I, I haven't talked to Rolly. Yeah, Rolly really sent an email okay. saying that it was kind of on hold until next year because of <coughs> projects that they had to do. Anyway, orphan docks are a huge problem on just about every lake. And I hear that every time I go to UBCM or every time I go to a rural area meeting. Orphan docks have become a real problem. And that, quite frankly, the province would like us to always deal with them. We at Christina Lake have had a lot of volunteers that have worked really, really hard to, to try and, and do something about those orphan dogs. I would point out one other thing that Brenda didn't really point out because I think it's really important. A lot of you here are very interested in milfoil. I need to clarify the fact that the stewardship does only research. They are not in charge of the milfoil program. The milfoil program is a regional district service. Uh, the stewardship is involved through through research and talking back and forth with the regional district. Okay, just to clarify that. So, big round of applause for Brenda and thank you.